We will get started. I said that and I lost Penny. She just ran out. I better wait. She's it. So it won't take me long to get going here. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was. Yeah, go for it. So we'll just get started, and thank you for coming. And I see there's white snow. I was at Dow High when it started coming, of course, so I got to hear that from the students right away. So, um, And how we're going to call snow days. So, um, yeah. So a topic that we've been working on for quite a while, and I think Penny may go into a little bit of the history of that, and um, the other one is, I think, as we've developed a lot of new initiatives in the district, which sometimes I call it initiative fatigue, um, our teachers feel it, we all feel it at times, um, we try to at least layer it or umbrella it into um, some of the areas. And so I think as we've grown, um, we see inclusion and diversity fitting into a whole campaign of what we call wellness. And so we started off one, uh, one time playing with some metal health, we called it at the time, school safety, um, inclusion and diversity, multi-tiered system of supports, a lot of different things, and I think we're trying to put it on at least one umbrella to kind of organize ourselves and what we're doing with all these initiatives and how they do all intermingle and fit under the concept of keeping everybody well going forward. So from there, Penny has kind of led this initiative and journey for us along with some of our outside partners, and so I'll let her pick up from there take off and we'll ask. Uh, but you'll questions. chime in when you I want. I always right? do. I can't help myself. Sorry. And uh, Jeff Jaster is with us, of course. Uh, I'm sure he'll have some pieces to contribute. And Brian Gertin's in the back. Uh, this has really been a team effort in creating our current state with uh, inclusion and diversity in our strategy. So thanks for being here. I'm excited to have another opportunity to reaffirm our district's commitment to creating a more inclusive environment. And our outcomes for today are that you leave better understanding the foundational pieces that we've put in place to do this work, the development of our strategy and the history of uh, why we are where we are right now with that work, and then a quick update of some of the things that are happening and will be happening. So uh, we'll move quickly through the historical pieces, but please stop if you have questions or need clarity. The timeline really is just to represent for you that this has been a journey. We launched this work in the fall of 2018 with our opening staff session. And actually, it started before that when Mr. Shero had a conversation with some community leaders about pieces that he was noticing in our district um, that were of concern and that we might not have the most inclusive school community and culture that he hoped to have as a leader. And that prompted us to invite Dr. Amy Beasley and Mr. Rob Valentine to our opening session. Again, this was in fall of 2018. And through their storytelling, their own personal stories about diversity, inclusion, well-being, they really set the stage for us to jump into this work. Through Dow's support, uh, we launched an initial team. We called it the core launch team a representative from each of our schools who would come alongside of us as district leaders to learn more about inclusion, diversity, equity, uh, and really put a strategy together. We spent much of last year learning and studying and understanding what this work looks like around the country and beyond uh, and put together a plan which we will show you some of the highlights of here in a bit. Ultimately, the plan was presented to the Board of Education in May of 2019, so at the end of last school year. Uh, and those, of course, are public meetings. We received a lot of positive feedback, um, both affirming that we're doing the right work at the right time um, and that this is important to the district. So we were very pleased as a team that our Board of Education openly supported our, our work in this area. We spent this, this past summer uh, continuing to refine our strategy and like our work even just in teaching and learning, uh, we continue to uh, gain research and insights about what really the best practices or evidence-based practices are in the space of inclusion and equity. And so we keep adjusting as we go. And I hope you will understand that that is how we will continue to function 
uh, a day doesn't pass where I don't receive some kind of email from a state or national organization or a research facility. I'm sure Mike and Jeff and Brian can say the same that speaks to inclusion, equity, diversity, well-being. So we're using all of that to continue informing our work. So it brings us to uh, the start of this school year where we use many of these same slides you'll see today at our opening staff session. We fully launched this work with all of our staff, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, anyone who wanted to come to that session was welcome. And uh, we followed that up also with an administrator session where we dug more deeply into this work and really have a, a collective commitment uh, to doing this work at the building levels as well as the district level. And so we launched, officially launched the strategy and then just in early October, we were able to bring together our community advisory team. And we can talk more about that here in a bit. So we're on our way. And yes, at times it feels slow. At times it feels hard. Um, but this kind of work is slow and it's hard. And I would say it needs to be very intentional and very focused. It's not something that you just make a quick decision and the system changes. So we ask you to be partners with us in that and understand that um, if we want to make the kind of change we need to make and really enhance our school culture the way we want to, it's an ongoing journey. And it will include all of you as parents and family members and caring adults, as well as school staff. I just wanted to recognize our launch team members Although you may not recognize all of these names, I assure you, there is a representative from each of our schools. We also had Pam Singer as a board representative uh, who was contributing to this work. We were very fortunate to have Dr. Amy Beasley from the Dow Chemical Company, Dow now, uh, and she is one of their leaders in the space of inclusion and provided us with lots of insights. We were also fortunate to have Leanne Keller-Rouse, who is the uh, president and CEO of Omnitech International, a consulting firm in town. And she really, as an external person, was able to facilitate the process for us. So our team came to this vision. And I'll just give you a minute to read that before I read it aloud. Everyone in our school community is valued, safe, treated with kindness and respect, and works together to make our community and world a better place. It feels like uh, an easy statement. It took us a lot of time to get to this particular combination of words. And we were pretty intentional in much of this. For example, the word valued uh, was really highlighted in a way uh, during our conversations because we were trying to find a word that would move us beyond tolerance and acceptance and really move us into a space where people are valued and we value one another and we seek to understand our own perspectives as well as others in the room. So I share that as an example of the power of each word that we've chosen um, and as a way for you to know that we were very thoughtful and deliberate in crafting this vision. We also know this vision is what's grounding our work. We come back to it when we think about decisions we need to make, when we think about programs that we're implementing, are we aligning our decisions and our processes with this vision of wanting everyone in our school community to be included? Uh, the process was interesting. Hello, welcome. We, Leanne, as I said, was our external facilitator, and she is a real process systems kind of person, and we needed someone who, who was a thinker in that way. She helped us gather research to put an inclusion and diversity model in place. And this is a little faint on one of these screens, so I apologize. I'll, I'll share with you what these components are. <laughs> Inclusive leadership is really about the leadership of the district. Do we have a vision? Yes, we do. Do we have a common understanding of the vision? Yes, we do. Are we developing and implementing a strategy? Yes, we are. Do the leaders embrace this and work day to day in accordance with this vision? Yes. Culture and behaviors, uh, somewhat overlapping inclusive leadership, but this really gets us to the building level to talk about uh, how we're operating. Do we have a culture code that we all can agree to? And that is a work in progress. 
Uh, are we seeing evidence of, of true inclusivity in our schools and how humans interact with one another? And of course, we put our kindness movement, which we'll learn more about here in a minute. Advocacy and education is uh, the third pillar, if you will, of this model. And this really speaks to ensuring that as an organization, we have inclusive <coughs> policies and procedures and practices, that the way in which we work and uh, interact with the community addresses our vision and our plan, and that we have adequate resources, including professional learning opportunities for our staff and ultimately learning experiences for our students. And the fourth, down in the bottom corner, social emotional learning and well-being. And I feel like uh, we as a group have talked about this over the past couple of years, if you've been with us for a few years. We've had a couple sessions about well-being and mental health. Uh, Jeff hit on it last time when we talked about safety and the importance of well-being and mental well-being uh, being a key component of school safety. So these four uh, components of the model is what really then informed our work moving forward in developing the pillars of our strategy. I will also take a moment to share, and I hope some of these visuals look familiar to you. Our team began to make connections with what we were learning about inclusion and equity. The Michigan Department of Ed has released social emotional learning, SEL, standards, competencies indicator standards in those five dimensions, um, and there are very strong connections to inclusion. Social awareness, self-awareness, decision-making, relationship skills. I hope you can see how that meshes so perfectly with inclusion. So we want to use those pieces, again, to support the work. The Michigan Department of Ed has also recently released their whole child model, and this is a really unique framework that helps us think about students more than just academically. So we want students to be healthy and safe and engaged and supported and challenged. And by partnering with our community, as you can see on the outside of that circle, uh, community meaning families and parents and, and caregivers, as well as all of our support agencies uh, and business partners, we can achieve those outcomes. So again, this has that common thread of of whole self and overall well-being. I put the 5D uh, plus teacher growth tool visual in there because I wanted you to know that we're also making connections for teachers and how our vision for inclusivity connects back to the tool that they use to, to measure their growth and ultimately their effectiveness as an educator. There is an entire dimension that is about classroom culture and environment. There is a huge component of that tool that speaks to building independent learners who have agency and uh, own their own learning and own their own behaviors and actions. So there's lots of important connections there. And then maybe the most powerful one is through our, our work with IB. As you know, all of our elementaries are international baccalaureate, primary year program schools, and we have the diploma program in both of our high schools. The attributes of the learner profile link directly with what we think are the attributes of being inclusive humans and having an inclusive school culture. So what we're trying to do is build connection, honor the good things that we already know we have been doing and are doing, and maybe analyze whether we just need to enhance some of those pieces in addition to all of the new strategies and ideas that we have as well. I lifted a couple of pieces specifically from IB because I do want you to leave here knowing that IB and inclusivity are, they're linked. And every time I read a new document from the International Baccalaureate, it strikes me in a different way how when we fully embrace what IB asks of us in terms of a learning community, we will reach that level of inclusivity. So again, these are lifted from an IB document that was just published here in December, or updated rather, in December of 2018. And it speaks specifically to the kind of learning environment, school-wide and classroom-wide. So teachers extend learning for all students by creating an affirming and responsive environment that considers student identities and embraces learner diversity from a strengths-based perspective. So again, we're not looking at diversity as a weakness. We're looking at the strengths that that brings to us 
as a learning community. The second bullet, the learning community embraces authentic, inclusive practices and supports everyone to flourish as learners. And maybe the most powerful statement lifted, and I'll just pick some key words here. International mindedness is a term that you hear frequently in all IB literature. It's in the curriculum, it's in all of the trainings that our teachers have. And international mindedness really is about inclusivity. It's about appreciating the value that diverse people and cultures, uh, ways of thinking bring to the classroom environment and to your school community. And I love that piece about developing empathy. So I hope you leave knowing that as we continue to advance and deepen our work with IB, uh, we're just on the cusp right now of our five-year self-assessment and review process for all of our elementaries and their IB programs. It will be an opportunity for us to look at these pieces of IB and think about whether we really have embedded those deeply enough. And if not, what can we do to leverage that existing framework already toward greater inclusion? So I'm bringing you back now to the work that we did uh, last summer in developing our overarching strategy. The team settled on four key vision elements. These are simply uh, elements and in, in ways in which we can organize the work that we know needs to be done and the learning that needs to be done. And you'll see some similarities back to that inclusion model, the four, uh, the four corners. So we settled on culture and values knowing that we really do need to consider our school culture, our district culture, but probably most importantly, the culture of each of our schools and making sure that those um, schools are fully inclusive and that we're tending to social emotional uh, well-being of students. Uh, down to the bottom corner, education and advocacy. Our activities and strategies proposed under this element are all about connecting with community resources. Uh, connecting with community agencies who also have a shared interest in building a more inclusive community because the one piece, and, and Mike talks about this so well, you know, we are a microcosm of our larger community. Yes, your children are with us for a large portion of their day, but then they go out into the community, they go back to your homes. How can we all work together toward these same outcomes? That's when we really make the kind of, of change that we need to make. So uh, advocacy is about partnership. I'd like you to leave knowing that and that we are reaching out to many partners uh, and engaging in, in shared work. It is also about the education, not just of our students. So it's not just looking at our curriculum and understanding where we can make adjustments. It's about the, the skills that our teachers need to have enhanced and how we can um, provide them with opportunities to think about how they have conversations in classrooms how they address situations in classrooms, how they themselves are more inclusive as a staff. Uh, because remember, for every aspect of diversity that we see in our students, we have that in the adults who work here at Midland Public Schools as well. So our vision was really founded in this idea of focus on students, and it will remain with a focus on students, but we also acknowledge that we are an employer of people. And uh, the people support, the adult people, <laughs> support the students. So we need to model and embrace those same practices. Moving to the upper corner, well-being. I feel like we've talked about this several times as a, as a team. This is well-being of adults and children. Um, Mike has talked before about mental health and all of the services and supports that we're rallying in the community and in the region putting together a more detailed plan to ensure that our students have optimal well-being, physical, emotional, and mental, and then that same parallel track for our adults. We do have a staff wellness committee that's, um, I would say, being revitalized right now, and we have some great partners who are really excited about making sure that we're tending to the well-being of, of the teachers. And finally, in that bottom corner, uh, internal and external communications. This is about two-way communication. It's about um, leveraging what uh, the superintendent has already put in place as many really robust channels to disseminate information to, to you as parents and to the broader community. But what else can we do to layer into that? I know you've talked about podcasts and uh, you know, some, some more two-way communication pieces. So we'll be looking at opportunities for that, particularly how it relates to 
inclusion, and school culture. We'll have an MPS app for you very soon. How's that? We're moving forward. <clears throat> wow. See, he's, he's just, he's on it. Um, I want to go um, maybe um, back just one piece to say that, um, maybe more than one piece, sorry. To this slide, I wanted to hit on a point, and I don't know why, maybe I looked at you, Mike, and it made me think of it. Um, we know that all of these pieces, combined with the academic focus we have, is what's really going to allow our students to grow and achieve. And um, Mike and the Board of Education have been very clear that, that our work is to close the gaps that students have. And I would suggest those are certainly academic gaps, and we have lots of evidence based on state assessments to show the academic gaps that kids have. I think what we uh, have not yet perfected is a way to measure the other gaps kids have. Mental health, overall well-being, uh, you know, they're social emotional. So please know that that is an area we're exploring. And when we talk about gaps, we know that you really can't um, you can't put the academic press on a kid the way that we want to if these other pieces aren't in place. If they are not bringing their whole selves to school and being their authentic selves and feeling included and supported and valued, it's hard to get them in a space where they're really willing to do the really challenging learning that our teachers have for them. So we're, we're running these sort of parallel tracks that I see quickly converging. Uh, the, the continued conversation about achievement and proficiency and growth academically has to be tie barred to all of these things that we're talking about today. And I'm really um, proud and excited to work for an organization that values that and sees that. So I don't want you to leave thinking that this is our new focus exclusively because they really are connected academic uh, mm -hmm. achievement. Okay, so. Look away if you get motion sick, because I'm going to advance a few slides here. <laughs> uh, that brings us up to the team's structure. We spent quite a bit of time figuring out how do you get this work done in an organization of our size, and how do you do that in a community like ours who cares so much and wants to be involved. So we put together, and this has seen a couple iterations. Uh, we have this core team in the middle, which is really a core group of, of internal staff who are leading this effort, kind of the day-to-day -day functioning. And from that, we have these supporting team structures. And I'll start at the top with the individual teams. We know, again, as I've said maybe 100 times just in the 20 minutes we've been here, uh, this kind of change happens best at the school level. The leadership of a principal and teachers and caring uh, engaged parents and families. So knowing that we are creating teams at each school who will implement the strategies that we're advising and create some of their own that fit their own school community is probably one of the most powerful components of this infrastructure. So please look and um, seek out opportunities at your child's school to be involved in activities related to inclusion. Moving clockwise, uh, we're considering the formation of an emergent issues team. So when we do have an unfortunate incident that becomes very public, that would be related to inclusion, diversity, or equity, that there is a coordinated response, certainly out of the superintendent's office, but that we know to gather the people involved who, who have the right information and that we can communicate appropriately uh, as needed to our community. And ensure that the needs of all parties are being met if there is an incident. The Administrative Council uh, represents all the leaders in our district, all building leaders, all district leaders. We meet regularly, and inclusion is an ongoing thread in our learning and our work. Continuing clockwise, the centers of excellence, or these multi multiple dis multidisciplinary teams, are uh, something that we have not quite launched yet, but what we're thinking is based on a particular activity that warrants uh, concentrated focus with people who can just really dig in and make it happen. And that could be a combination of school staff or potentially community members. 
And then finally, the family, student, and community advisory team. This was initially called the parent advisory team, then it was called the parent and community advisory team. Then we realized that family is a more inclusive term than parents because not all of our children currently reside with a parent. So we're settling right now with family, student, and community. And I'm open to suggestions that you might have that could be more inclusive. Uh, this is a select team of family members, folks from community agencies or local businesses, and representative students from our two high schools. And I'm so excited to say we finally met. We had our first meeting in October. We are spending considerable time getting to know one another and building ourselves as a trusting team because we know that we have critical conversations to have, um, important uh, discussions to have, and so you need to really get to know one another. We've worked hard to ensure that the community members, family members who were selected, represent the diversity of our student population. Age, race, religion, uh, ethnicity, ability, all facets of the human experience, we have uh, folks who represent that or are representing their child um, who may identify uh, or, or be from one of those categories. So I'm excited about what this committee will do and how they will advise us and support the work. Again, it's slow, but I think it's important that we continue to meet monthly and build ourselves as a team. I have a question. How did you pick the student reps for that? It's a great question. Uh, we really struggled with that, and um, I'll share with you, Karen, we at first thought we would have a separate student advisory team, and I was really sold on that. And as I started to consider it more, I think sometimes we, um, we forget to ask kids, and their voice is as powerful, if not more sometimes, than the adults in our system. They're the ones experiencing day to day what's happening in our classrooms and our schools. So we went from an idea of maybe having a 20-member student team and then the separate adult team to merging them. And because we wanted to keep the team at a reasonable number, we opted to, right now for phase one, just have representatives from the two high schools. Um, we have three from Midland High and actually four from Dow High. The reason there's four from Dow High is there is a CAS group, an IB diploma group, who's working on their community activity service project. And they really wanted to come as a team because the nature of their work is closely aligned to this. So students who are very willing and comfortable to be in the same space as adults and, and have these kind of conversations that aren't always comfortable. And again, we've had one meeting, so we're going to see how it goes. Uh, Depending on the nature and how this group kind of ebbs and flows, we may consider middle school students. I'm not certain at this time that elementary students, that that's really an appropriate point of engagement for them. Um, but certainly we encourage these building level teams to include students. And I think that's where the most powerful uh, point of student voice will come. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So it's our team structure currently being uh, developed. I hope you've all in the communique, the superintendent's communique, seen pictures and read passages about our hashtag Keep It Kind MPS campaign. The initial launch team, um, I think actually in this very room, after a long day session over in the summer, came up with this idea of how do we really spark enthusiasm and excitement about inclusion. And many might say, well, kindness is really soft. That is not the same as inclusion, and it's not. And we've been very open about that. But we do think that kindness is a gateway into a conversation to get to know someone, to back connecting to part of our vision, to understand, value, engage with another human. And through that initial act of kindness, you can build a relationship, which then helps you become more inclusive. So we very much stand by our hashtag Keep It Kind MPS campaign. I think there's been a lot of uh, positivity come from this. I think a lot of folks are thinking about how they interact with others. Um, oh, I'll bring you some bracelets before you leave. If you'd like one, we have bracelets. Looks like Cindy's on it. Uh, we have bracelets, and at our opening session, we handed those out to staff. We gave them each two, and we asked them to wear one and then to pass one on when they saw an act of kindness or themselves had an act of kindness. Uh, so, and now students with Kindness Week coming up next week, 
uh, students will be getting bracelets as well and encouraged to do the same thing. So we are excited. We hope to continue sharing hashtag keep it kindness, keep it kind MPS. We encourage you, if you see things, to tweet those out or to share them with Cindy Young or the superintendent. So what's happening? Uh, lots, and this is kind of a, a high level list. But as I said, we've made some progress with, and there are, I'll just point out, Sudi, there are adult sizes on one side, and these are children's sizes on the other, and you're welcome to take as, as many as you like. Um, opening session, I think, was a success. We received a lot of positive feedback from staff, affirming that they're excited that we're engaged in this learning and work. The administrator session that I mentioned, again, very favorable. Uh, I feel like there's a real collective commitment to doing this. Kindness Week and our hashtag Keep It Kind MPS campaign. The advisory team has launched. There are lots of school-based activities, and I will say that you may know more than I do because you're likely out in your schools to see these things happening. But we know, uh, for example, at Midland High, they had, with their orientation before school started, all of their freshmen went through a 30-minute rotation that was about creating a sense of belonging and inclusion. Um, we know that Siebert is doing all kinds of activities around kindness and building an inclusive culture. Uh, Mr. Shero was in a classroom today. Yeah, so I went into a German classroom today and um, he did his lesson around um, when maybe someone hasn't, um, who has been excluded based on gender, race, and he used a German scientist who was responsible for splitting the atom. There was two, two that did that work a female and a male, but the male in the early days predominantly got the credit. That's changed over time. And then, of course, he turned it to them, and where they maybe at some point in their life where they had been excluded, um, similar. So, great lesson. I was so excited when he came back this morning and told me that story because to me, that is exactly what we want happening. We want teachers to be reconsidering how they're teaching particular topics bringing in other resources, helping students see different perspectives, um, and looking at things that maybe we've looked at for a really long time historically through the, this lens, but there are 10 different ways to look at it. So of all the things, that might have been like the high point of the day to know that that was happening in one of our high school classrooms. Lots of things like that I'm sure we could point to. Uh, professional learning is really going to be one of the most prominent things that we will have happening uh, our teachers have been clear that they, um, they support this, they believe in this work, but it has not necessarily been part of their learning, either through their own college preparation program or through learning that we've provided them as a district. So we will be focused on professional learning experiences that address topics related to inclusion, diversity, social emotional learning, well-being, school safety, all the things that, that fit in this bucket. And we're super fortunate that we are in a community where others are engaged in this too. Just last week I attended the Human Library event that was sponsored by a host of our community partners and was so happy to see several teachers at that event who then now want to come back and replicate that experience. I know um, the Cultural Awareness Committee through the Midland Area Community Foundation, we partner with them. They've offered a variety of activities over the month of October, which was Cultural Awareness Month, and we had teachers engaged in that. So we're gonna leverage what we can that's already happening. We're gonna partner with others to come up with ideas, and we will host some of our own professional learning as well. We've formed a really special partnership with Dr. Ken Jolly. He's a professor from Saginaw Valley State University. He has been at every PD session so far this year over at Midland High offering, at least as one of their rotation sessions, uh, some learning experience related to inclusion and equity. And he actually came and worked with our core team at one point as well. So we know there are folks out there who have this expertise and this passion. Uh, if you know of anyone who would be willing, I'm, I'm happy to talk with them and see where we can make that fit. So uh, I'll just share too that our curriculum office, the team here at the district level, uh, is really focused on this work. We're considering how we can revise some of our traditional processes so that we're making decisions in different ways. If we're going to adopt a, a new resource, have we really thought about whether that resource promotes our vision statement? If we're purchasing new materials for a school library, are we thinking about uh, the diversity of the authors? Are we thinking about 
um, students being able to see themselves in those materials or have windows uh, to see into the lives of others that they may not hear in our Midland community. So the intentionality piece is, is what we're focused on. Uh, and we're also engaged in our own training. A core group of us, six of us, are participating in a six session series about cultural proficiency sponsored through the Department of Ed and it's a very intense uh, and intentional learning experience. I have a question. Yes. Are you also looking at um, curriculums that are being taught? Um, for example, I was very distressed to see that 10th grade American literature at Midland High was primarily white, um, primarily male. And I know the teachers don't, I mean, they have a limited amount. But I just wonder if that is part of your curriculum discussions. Are you talking about what you're actually teaching and how what you're saying is American literature are these white men primarily? Thank you for that. Uh, actually, yes. The English department just recently had a conversation about that very topic. Uh, we function uh, as a system that there are approved books, books that have been approved by the Board of Education, and those date back, well, probably some of the titles you, you know of, decades and decades. Um, we, we have been deliberate in trying to bring in more diversity into our selection. There are a couple of books right now that are open for public uh, review. They went to the Board of Education last month for information, and those would be for ninth grade. But I, I share that as evidence to say that yes, we are considering those things, and I would agree American literature is much more than the handful of books that were listed on that course syllabus. Increased communication, I feel like we've already talked about that, and Mike even weighed in. Uh, we hope that you will continue to hear more in school publications about kindness, about inclusion, about equity. Already talked about collaboration with community partners. Uh, I'll just share student voice and student action. Again, one of the most powerful ways that you change systems is uh, letting those, those users of the system have voice and helping them build agency and helping them make change. We have a student group at Midland High that's forming, uh, sort of an action team that will advise school leadership there. About, about work that they want to be part of and see have done. And we have cast groups, as I mentioned. We have these smaller groups of students at Dow High who are focused intently on research and action uh, related to this topic. We also have our culture clubs, and I think there is a plan uh, in the elementaries that don't currently have those of expanding, and I think that is a nice bridge. It's similar to the kindness and what I shared about kindness. The culture clubs don't don't necessarily directly impact inclusion, but it builds an opportunity for learning, it builds an opportunity for conversation. Jeff, what might you add, if I get you a mic, about restorative practices? Because we have intentionally listed this as part of our uh, inclusion strategy. Hey, I just totally put him on the spot too, by the way. He didn't know I was gonna ask him. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're a team. Um, good afternoon. So as far as restorative practices training, we have uh, currently scheduled groups from each of the high schools, an administrator and counselor to attend sessions in November and December at the Claire Gladwin RESD. Also working with the gentleman who did our opening PD session on restorative practices to try to arrange for additional training for other building teams to attend in the hope is simply that if we're going to move in this direction that we have folks in each building who are comfortable to do it and have the skill set to do it because if they're done wrong well frankly that's a disaster and it's worse for everybody if they're involved in one that's not handled the right way so so we're trying to empower um, staff with information and have teams at each building who can do it and we do have a community uh, resource or two some folks in the community who are trained um, I know we've mentioned Jackie Warner's name quite a bit. Uh, she and her her new colleague, um, I forget her first name, uh, Knuckle, Le Lexi? Kathy? Kathy no. Too. Is it Kathy? Okay. Kathy Knuckle um, is um, working with Jackie this year, and they're going to both be trained in facilitating restorative circles. Thanks. Yep. I'll just add that we believe restorative practices is an important component of our work with inclusion because, um, well, first off, punitive doesn't always work. 
And we are about teaching and learning. So when there is um, an injustice that happens, when there is a negative interaction between youth, when someone feels wronged, uh, the punitive route doesn't teach and it doesn't restore a relationship. And a big part of this work is building a sense of community, building a, a learning community that's trusting and connected so that students can be safe and be vulnerable and do the work, the heavy lifting that they need to do to learn. So when you exclude someone and punish them, it, it has a negative impact on the rest of that classroom and the last, rest of that uh, learning community. So we know we still have work to do in deeply understanding restorative practices and embedding that uh, in our day to day, but it's worth doing. I'll also just, uh, one piece I'd really love for you to leave with is we could stand here all day and list activities that are happening and cool things that Mike puts in the communique and awesome things that we present to you. But really, the greatest sign to all of you as community members and family members is to know and see that inclusion is just who we are and it's how we function. It's how we're making decisions. It's how we're having conversations. And I hope that you begin to see signs that that's how our culture is changing and how we're changing as an organization. Uh, what time is it, Brian? I can't see the clock. OK, so we have a few minutes. I would love. Um, for you to engage in this activity, if you are comfortable doing so, take one and pass it on. This is a reflection activity that we sometimes use with students. It's a way to process the information because I really did a lot of talking, which is not ideal teaching and learning, right? So uh, this is a strategy that you can use to just think about the triangle has three points. What are three key points that you learned today? What are three things that you can take away and share and share with others. What's squared in your thinking? What's something that you heard today that you really agree with, you connect with, you can support? And what is something that still is sort of circling in your head? Something that I said or that you heard that didn't quite make sense, that you want to know more about, or that you need clarification? And we will share these out. And if you want me to follow up with you personally, please leave your name and I can do that. I'm gonna give you about three or four minutes. I'll kind of gauge where you are in your work. Go ahead and finish that thought that you're writing, and we'll reconvene. Please only share if you're comfortable. Uh, if you're not, perfectly fine. Is there anyone who might be willing to share something that they've learned today that they're willing to take away and go share with others? I, I had not thought about the restorative justice part of, um, or practices part of things, but I, I see that as being very important. I was not really aware that the IB curriculum is so in sync with the IND, and I only put down those two. I Thank you. That's fine. Those are two great ones. We'll take those. Anyone else want to share their, their triangle comments? Thanks, Jen. I very much appreciated that the word value was chose on purpose to go beyond just tolerating someone or something. Um, I think that was a really important key piece that you said. Thanks for sharing that. I like the social emotional part of being mm -hmm. in inclusion because it's so important. That right. They learn how to interact with everybody, and that's a big part. Yes. Thank you for that. And I'll just share, uh, super excited, this week we were able to onboard our multi-tiered systems of support coordinator. We've had a uh, posting out, we interviewed, it's taken a little longer than maybe we hoped, but we have a new member of our team. And 
uh, the sole focus of her job is going to be helping us identify evidence-based strategies, particularly for social emotional learning in the beginning, that, uh, that we can use in classrooms so that we're, we ensure that we're explicitly teaching those pieces. And I've been reading a lot about how we want to think uh, empathy and compassion are just inherent to humans, and they're not. You really need to, to provide students opportunities to learn those, both hopefully at home, as I'm sure all of you do, but also at school. What is squared in your thinking, something that you agree with and support? Anyone willing to share a thought from that? Thank you. Um, I, I really um, think that, I agree that partnerships or seeking out partnerships outside of you know, the, the school district are, is really vital. I, I like that um, we've looked at outside experts. Uh, we've looked at organizations like Dow, yeah. you know, to try to get kind of an outside perspective on this. Um, that kind of leads into something that is circling in my head. Feel <laughs> you know, free, um, please share. I would like to learn more about NPS's partnership with uh, the Midland County ESA okay. in this this work. Um, yeah, you know, I know that. I have a unique perspective because I have a child that's served by Midland Public Schools, and then I have a child that's served by the ESA, you know, in the same building. And I do think that that can be confusing. <laughs> you know, okay. you get messages from two different, essentially two different school districts. And so I'm interested in learning more about how you collaborate sure. and if there's opportunities to improve. That's a, a great thought. Although there may be separate parent organizations, if you will, if we're all under the same roof, there is a sense of community that we need to build. So thank I, you for that. We can and I think it could be a future topic yeah. as well for us at this group. That's a great one to bring up. That unusual partnership, it's actually unusual in the sense that, um, yeah, um, well, in the fact that it's housed in our building. So in most counties, um, you're going to see your ISDs have their own facility for those children. And so... Um, we are stepping on each other's toes all the time, accidentally, and so it's and it's historical. I mean, it's been there for a long time, and so uh, both superintendent there and I have really tried to figure that out. And I'll tell you, we still offend each other at times, and we still do things like that. And so it's a constant work in progress. But um, yeah, we see we look at it as. And not all those children are actually ours, but we, we see every ESA student that has an MPS address is also our student. And so, uh, and we know we're not the overseer necessarily, but anywhere we can partner in the system. Now, make sure you understand there are out county kids in those programs that come to our buildings as well. Thank you for that. Uh, we can toggle between uh, any of these if, you, if anyone's willing to share something that's squared in your thinking, something that's still circling that you're thinking about. Um, I see process as a pendulum. Sure. And um, the commentary about the 10th grade lit, mm -hmm. I see some red flags. And the red flag I see is that I don't want I and D to be the main driver of curriculum. In other words, just because something is male and white as an author does not mean that the content is not in you know inclusive and diverse. I I just see those kinds of things as being a possible problem. It's a great point and actually that was a layer to the conversation with some of the English teachers. The you know the historical canon if you will, the the text that we've we're probably taught as high school students and we continue to teach. There is value and there is a place for those. Uh, how do we integrate other works um, I've heard it'd be an ongoing conversation for us. I've heard the words used brought alongside of, not yeah. replacing of. I don't know what, but it is out. The it, concept of, say, I'm a musician, so the concept that the music I play is white from a dead man, that somehow what right. I'm playing doesn't have the value, value of something contemporary by a living female artist. There's the content of what's in there is not necessarily. And because I brought it up, I'll also tell you it's also very 20th century, mm -hmm. um, which also is disturbing to me because American literature did not start in 1900. Yeah, so I, I just so, see this now, the other, so I, now the other piece I would to, say on some of this, keep in mind, that's why this work is difficult. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and Jen said valued earlier, and I want to step up and say the, probably the most difficult part of this 
because it's easy to do some of the other pieces, first steps, but to, to actually get devalued, um, and I've just began to myself understand that full context of that. But anyway, they also got to remember we are driven, like it or not, by state curriculum. And so, um, and I don't always like it, but um, so we have sift very much that this, and it is 20th century space because it tends to be what's required taught by MD is where I was going. Doesn't mean we can't get there, but that probably is why you're seeing some of that. And then just to have, to read five books and have them all be the same type of author. Yeah. Not that you should totally get rid of it, but yeah. It, it, I guess the content to me is... So when we explore a lot of these pieces of it, um, we've learned to give ch children choice. Right. Help me here, baby, because yeah. I'll step somewhere wrong. No, around. I think choice is important. Both teachers have choice in how they reach a particular required standard and what text or text sets they may use. And we are seeing some movement toward maybe excerpts from some of the books you've referenced paired with a smaller short story, um, an article from a newspaper... How do you provide a, maybe a picture? A picture is also a, a valid text, if you will. So, so we're a public school system, too, and we've always got to be mindful of that. And so, you know, we're going to head into a very difficult time period for schools next November, prior to that. And so um, we, a lot of, and we've been doing a lot of legwork to try to keep, be preactive pre versus reactive of what may come. And so, and I've learned a lot of this, of choice and letting children come to conclusions, providing them evidence, choice materials, and letting them come to conclusions instead of us leading them to. I think that helps even in this area. We don't eliminate some of this stuff. It's a choice, it's materials, and they'll come to hopefully whatever conclusion they all, that's why we live here, right? We all get to come to whatever conclusion. Yeah. So ongoing conversation. I'm, I'm gonna go to Sally quick. She had a comment, and then we'll come right to you, Karen. I, w I was just saying that I was glad that you brought this up because it gave me a little more insight into the process of reviewing and choosing mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, you know, just because something was chosen, I mean, some of it, you're right, some of these books are decades old, you know, part of the curriculum. And if we do have a process, and it sounds like you do, where you're constantly reviewing, then you can freshen it up because right. the things that I learned in the 80s and 90s, you know, maybe just are not relevant today, you know, so that but our discussion moved forward. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Karen? Um, I think in some regards it's important to read the classics from decades ago, mm -hmm. even if they're written by white men. I agree with you that there's a lot of them. But when my daughter came home when she was in 11th grade last year and said, Mom, I love this book. It was a choice book. You've got to read it. That tells me that the teachers are teaching the classics, teaching what they're required to by the state, and also giving children a choice in a whole variety of different books. And this is a very out-of-America book that she was reading. It wasn't even placed in the United States. It was out of the, it was like in Europe. So they have opportunities, as you're saying, about choice if the teachers structure the classes right to be able to right. teach what they need to from the state perspective, yes. but also give the kids variety that they may never have been exposed to before. Thank you for that. So, friends, we have about three minutes left. Uh, I don't, this is amazing conversation. You're welcome to stay after if you'd like to talk more. Uh, if you are comfortable leaving your sheet with me, I'd be happy to, to process those and consider those. If you want direct follow-up from me, I'd ask that you leave your name. You're also welcome to take those with you. If those are your notes and how you want to go back to your individual school community and talk about this experience, you can take those with you. Uh, I just want to conclude by sharing our vision one more time. Um, I hope you'll see this published in a variety of ways, both in district publications, I know Cindy uses it, as well as at your local school. Um, and again, as I said before, I encourage you to seek out opportunities at your school level to engage in activities related to inclusion, diversity, and equity. Anything else, Mr. Sherrill? Well, thank you for coming. Hopefully the little late stuff goes away for a while. I'm a winter guy. I like it a little early for that. It's a little early. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>